Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Canada Today Show. Thank you again for joining us one more time. This is Taha Ghuyur, your host on Canada Today, uh, which is live on Muslim Network TV, and you can watch it on muslimnetwork.tv as well as on our social media pages. Um, every day, every week, we bring you some interesting, critical, sometimes controversial topics. Um, and the right presenters to talk about such issues that matter to Canadians, to Canadian Muslims in particular. Today, we have um, two wonderful guests who are going to be talking to us about uh, a topic that has made quite a few headlines over the past few months, especially since last summer, 2019. Uh, we have heard uh, about Bill 21 a few times. Bill 21, based out of uh, the province of Quebec, um, and but late for a common Muslim living in the uh, city of Montreal or in in the province of Quebec, um, anywhere, this is a day-to-day -day struggle um, that they have to deal with. It has very far-reaching implications for uh, marginalized communities, uh, racialized communities. Um, Muslim communities in particular, as well as Muslim uh, communities uh, who practice, um, visibly practice their faith. So we'll talk a little bit, uh, I will talk about um, Bill 21, its implications, uh, legal challenges against it. And to do that, we have two guests. Uh, I'll start off with uh, inviting Samir Mazoub, who served as the president of Canadian Muslim Forum, which is a Canadian advocacy and civic engagement organization. He is also a multi-award winning activist, community builder, uh, public speaker, and a writer. Samir has been a recipient of the uh, Queen Elizabeth Diamond Jubilee uh, Medal for his 20 years of public service in Canada. He's been recognized for multiple volunteer-led community initiatives, including positive integration projects, large-scale blood donation drives, youth projects, schools, and more. Samir has earned a Bachelor's of Business from Concordia University in Montreal, and he works as a financial and business consultant. So thank you, Samir, for being here on our show today. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum Thank you. You're welcome. And uh, next we have Farid Khan. Farid Khan is a founder of Canadians uh, United Against Hate, an anti-racism activist group. He also serves as Director of Advocacy and Media Relations for Rohingya Human Rights Network. Farid has a professional background with over 30 years experience in strategic communications, advocacy, and public policy development and media relations. Farid has held leadership positions across numerous national and community-based charitable, civic, and business organizations in Canada and United States. Uh, through his volunteer work, Farid has helped raise a quarter million dollars um, for charitable causes in areas like education, health, and international development. Farid earned his graduate studies um, uh, in, from Carleton University, where he focused on policy, uh, public policy, foreign affairs, and national security, as well as communications. Uh, Farid consults in the areas of public policy, advocacy, media relations, strategic communications, as well as stakeholders relations. Um, so welcome Farid on uh, to Canada Today Show for the first time. Thank you very much. Salam alaikum to everybody. Welcome, salam. Thank you once again. Okay, so um, we'll start off uh, with Samir. Samir, you know, for those of us uh, living in other, perhaps other parts of Canada or across maybe somewhere in the US, south of the border, um, who may not have an idea even what um, Bill 21 is all about. Uh, let's start us right at the top. Help us understand what are we talking about when we when we say Bill 21? What what are we talking about? This idea of uh, you know lacity of uh, of the state or secularism and Quebec identity or Quebec identity um, protecting the French language. I mean, there's too many jargons here that I'm sure we hear when we hear about Bill 21. So tell us a little bit about what it is before we get into the implications and, and you know, uh, the current fight against it, which we'll talk about a bit later. Okay. Uh, 
Bill 21 is not built anymore. It is a low. So it is low 21 now. And, and the whole concept, uh, as it is being presented, this is to defend the secularism of the society, where there is a, a prohibition of the so-called uh, religious symbols in certain jobs uh, at the government levels. So this is uh, basically one line. This is what is uh, law 21, prohibiting what they call uh, religious symbols at uh, certain jobs uh, in the government, like uh, judges, and police officers, commissioners, and teachers, for example, in schools, in public schools. So uh, in one line, this is the, the, the whole thing. And, and the, let's put it this way, uh, this is not something new for Quebec. It has originated for many years before. If you all remember the Charles de Valer that was presented by the Parti Québécois 2014-2013-14. And, and, but it was much wider the scope at that time to, uh, to prohibit uh, religious symbols at much wider scope at that time. Now with the CAC, with the uh, Legault's government in Quebec, uh, he went back to this after the elections and he presented it just to limit it to certain jobs. And here we are uh, suffering as it is results, but later on we'll speak about its implications. Hmm. So, uh, Farid, I wanted to ask you, uh, be, be, again, once again, before we get into the, the implications and details of Bill 21, um, isn't there a precursor uh, to this, uh, which, you know, was often called the Niqab ban uh, in the Quebec uh, province uh, or Bill 62? Um, you know, can you tell us a little bit about that bill and how that, of course, let, you know, paved the way for uh, Bill uh, 21, perhaps? Uh, sure. Um, bill 62 was introduced by the, <clears throat> the former liberal government, and essentially it was a ban on uh, people wearing face coverings if they wanted to receive public uh, government services. However, it was challenged in the courts, and so the um, those provisions of the bill were reserved until the court challenges went through. But that was the latest iteration of, uh, of efforts by uh, Quebec governments going back to the 2000s when the whole issue of um, reasonable accommodation uh, was being discussed publicly. And at that time, the, uh, the government in Quebec was liberal under Jean Charest. Um, the Taylor Bouchard Commission, I, th I think it was Taylor Bouchard, if I remember correctly, came out with a report. And then following that report, of course, uh, there was a change in government. You had the, the Parti Québécois come in. They tried to introduce their Charter of Values. Then uh, later we had the Liberal government introduce Bill 62. They got defeated and then the CAQ came in and they finally introduced Bill Law 21, um, which was uh, uh, passed. Now, the thing is, one has to understand that throughout the last, let's say, about 15 years, this has been this has been basically focused on targeting Quebec's Muslim community. That's what the whole reasonable accommodation debate was about. That's what the Charter of Values targeted. That's what Bill 62 targeted. And the CAQ decided, well, you know what? We can't get away with targeting only one community. So we're going to target all faith groups uh, with this uh, legislation. But one has to understand that the underlying cause of uh, Bill 21 was to target the Muslim community. And in a poll done after Bill 21 was passed, and this was covered in, um, in a couple of articles, it basically said that, yeah, this is about uh, targeting Muslims. So Muslims are the main target of this bill, and it's unfortunate, of course, that um, other faith communities like Sikhs and Jews have also been called into it. So this is not just a Muslim issue anymore. Even if it had just been focused on Muslims, it's about human rights, basic human rights and freedom to practice your faith. And so we, we you know, um, Samer has done a very good job through his organization, allying with uh, other community and faith groups to try and challenge uh, what is essentially a racist and bigoted law. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing uh, that, that uh, you know, sort of background that is important for us to know. Now, um, the last federal election, uh, Bill 21 came up quite a few times and uh, there were some promises, there were some conversations, there were some people who were defending it, some of the candidates, of course. Um, I wanted to hear from you, Fareed, um, since that election, has anything changed? Um, has the federal government 
uh, intervened? Um, and if not, then what is uh, what, what's the reason? I mean, why have we not seen any action against uh, you know implementation of Bill Twenty One from the federal government? Well, yeah, it's been uh, it's been a year since the election when this was being discussed, and with the exception of the liberals who said they were open to intervening. All the other party leaders at the time um, basically said, no, this is within Quebec's right. And um, I'm sorry, but that that demonstrated a severe lack of leadership. One of the main goals of any political party leader, particularly if they want to be prime minister of this country, is that they are there to defend the rights of all Canadians, regardless of what political considerations there may be. Now, the federal government left the door open to intervening politically in some fashion or legally, um, but they were not going to intervene while there was a court case that was in the process of uh, being challenged in, in the courts. Um, back in the spring, the Supreme Court of Canada decided that they were not going to hear the uh, court challenge on Bill 21. I'm not aware of any other court cases that are ongoing right now, but now a year later after the election, it's now time for the federal government and Justin Trudeau to basically take action. I think uh, a year of waiting uh, now that the legal um, decision from the Supreme Court not to hear the case has been made, it's now time for it to be dealt with at the political level. And, and just on a closing note, um, one of the reasons why you know I would say that uh, leaders have been acting in such a cowardly fashion on this issue is because they're looking at Quebec's 78 seats in the House of Commons. Um, Francois Legault has very often said, well, of course, you know, I'm passing this law because the majority of Quebecers want it. Well, you know what? At one point, a majority of people felt that slavery was okay, but that wasn't right. At one point, a majority of people didn't want Jews to enter the country. That wasn't right. At one one point, people didn't want to give uh, uh, civil liberties and human rights to LGBTQ people, and that wasn't right. This is just basically wrong on every Mm -hmm. level. And, uh, you know, we have to continue the fight to defend the rights, not just of Muslims, but of anybody targeted by such laws anywhere in the country. Excellent points. And I'll come back to you on that, uh, the whole idea of majority supporting this. Um, uh, I wanted to ask you, Samer, uh, we just talked about, I mean, Farid just talked about uh, Justin Trudeau and the, you know, liberal government's um, promise to do something about it. But here you have a new conservative party leader uh, and Aaron O'Toole who um, has been essentially, uh, at least in a, he seems to be supporting, coming out in support of Bill 21. Um, he said that it is a priority to support the secularism, uh, of course, of the Quebec uh, province. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, it seems uh, he's very, uh, he's careful not to n- necessarily come out and say that he's not going to do anything about it, but he seems to be supporting, um, you know, the status quo at this point. Um, so I wanted to ask you, what are your thoughts on um, on this? I mean, Aaron's uh, statement, you know, seems to be in conflict with the promises that he's been making about improved uh, tolerance in Canada, fighting for human rights, talking about rights of women. Yet, you know, the Bill 21, you know, very specifically targets women of a specific uh, you know faith group. So I wanted to hear your thoughts on uh, on what we have just heard in the last couple of days from uh, Aaron O'Toole on this. Okay, uh, thank you. First, I would like to just, uh, for uh, Brother Farid, the courts did not deny uh, the right to hear the cause, the cause uh, or the case. What happened is that there was a request to, for injunction until the case goes to the courts, okay? So the refusal from the courts is to get the injunction uh, activated. And this is because the uh, provincial government they use the notwithstanding clause that overwrite uh, certain uh, clauses in the in the shots of freedom uh, in, in Canada. So this is what uh, what uh, Francois Rigaud did. So now back to your question: uh, in, uh, all the federal governments uh, are very worried to show any clear position about Law 21, and this is in particular, as Brother Farid mentioned, it has to do with uh, election purposes. So people are looking, uh, or the federal government, or I'm sorry, the federal uh, uh, parties are looking forward for to get to earn some more votes in Quebec. Unfortunately, I, I don't know what is going on exactly here. I sat down with each and every uh, political party that you might imagine, leaders uh, from all aspects of the political parties, and we were very open about this. 
Uh, what do you think uh, by pleasing uh, extreme elements in Quebec, you are ready to override the, the basic, basic human rights of Canadians, especially women we are talking about here. Uh, yes, the law doesn't say that I'm targeting Muslims, but in, uh, in, in reality, the implication of such law is targeting Muslims, and especially women. And, and the irony, if you don't mind to just clarify one thing, the law has what they call grandfather or grandparent, a grandfather clause. A grandfather clause means that whoever works in the in, in the domain now will not be fired because of this new law. In other words, all the all the sisters per se that are working in the public system in the schools that are coming from overseas, they have kept their jobs. So who will be deprived from such job? Believe it or not, they are the, the Quebec women, young women born in Quebec, studied in Quebec in education, and now they would like to apply. Those people are denied. So in reality, we are denying those jobs based on the, the because they are women for a second, because they are Muslim women, uh, and they are all born in Quebec. I mean, mostly those young women that would like to study education. I'm in education, I know exactly the number of people and young women that are trying to do so. So now back to the government. Oh, totally, I heard him, what he's saying. He's trying to please Francois de Gaulle and his, uh, his, his uh, population. And this is unfortunately, even during the last election, the only party that says, okay, I'm ready to listen or I'm, ready, I'm open to court challenges is the Liberal Party. But at the end of the day, in reality, no party has come out to say, you know, this is Canadians, this is human rights of Canadians, this is women, they have the right not to be discriminated against. And if you don't mind, uh, Brother Taha, I'll just uh, close the law. Uh, my, my worrisome is not about the law itself, it's by legitimizing uh, discrimination. I'm here legitimizing discrimination. I'm saying that's fine to, I'm giving an approval to hate and the bigotry. And this is the wider, much wider implication. It is okay for Islamophobia. It is okay for the <laughs> hate. And this is what we have seen as a result of such kind of laws, unfortunately. Mm. So, so Farid, uh, let me ask you this. I mean, how, uh, how does one's right to display religious symbols um, make this person, um, do uh, you know, or, or uh, the act of I guess displaying religious symbols is is it in conflict uh, um, with secularism? I mean, why is it such a threat to secularism in the Quebec um, th that somebody decides to put a kippah on or or turban on or or hijab on? Um, why is it such a big deal? And why is it that an overwhelming majority? I mean, according to one poll back in October 2019. The Ipsos one, I believe, uh, showed that uh, three quarters of Quebec, uh, Co uh, Quebecers uh, are in favor of it. Only a quarter actually um, said uh, they have a problem with Bill 21. Yeah, well, there is there is no threat to secularism. It's a red herring. If um, if this government really wanted to make Quebec a completely secular state, um, well, then let's get rid of the Christian cross, which sits in the Quebec flag. Let's get rid of all the buildings and roads and towns and cities that are named after Catholic saints. Um, let's get you know get rid of those uh, those symbols of Christianity in uh, in Quebec. The fact is, this has nothing to do with secularism. That is just an argument that's being used to justify religious bigotry. And um, for anyone, uh, you know, your reference to the people who uh, who. Um, uh, the poll that the number of people who are in support of it. Well, of course, there's going to be an increase or a large number of uh, people who are in support of it. And and if you break that number down, the vast, vast majority of those supporters are Francophone Quebecers who are predominantly white. So this has nothing to do with secularism. I mean, if you look anywhere in Canada, you've got people wearing turbans as police officers, um, as, uh, you know, uh, uh, people, uh, uh, lawyers wearing hijabs in court, teachers wearing hijabs, that has nothing to do with, um, you know, promoting their faith. They just go out and they do their job. The fact that they visibly display their faith is neither here nor there. I grew up in Canada at a time when, um, you know, the vast majority of teachers were white. And there was a lot of teachers who would wear a cross that was very visible. To me, that didn't mean they were promoting their faith uh, or, you know, putting their faith in my face. In fact, you know, if you want to talk about um, secularism, um, then, you know, this Christmas, maybe there shouldn't be a Christmas tree or Christmas lights around the Quebec legislature. Maybe uh, Quebec politicians of CAQ shouldn't be participating in Christmas-related activities. 
So, you know, you look at all of this and it's sheer hypocrisy, sheer hypocrisy on the part of uh, uh, Francois Legault and his party to say that this has anything to do with secularism. It is out and out a demonstration of their um, internal bigotry against a, a particular racialized minority group, which is Muslims, but they're happy to discriminate against other uh, groups like Sikhs and Jews and, and even indigenous people who, you know, the, the display of their spirituality is the way they look through their hair and, mm -hmm. and, and what they wear. So are they going to tell them also that uh, they can't wear those uh, or have long hair uh, because, uh, you know, it uh, conflicts with this uh, uh, secularism law? No, it's, it's about hypocrisy, plain and simple, and it is about bigotry against a particular faith group. Very interesting. Um... Um, the Lego government in Quebec has uh, not addressed the community-wide impact of secularism law. I mean, they, you know, what 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 would happen uh, in terms of uh, this the division that is caused in the community? And there are experts who are actually predicting that um, you know, similar to the deaths we have seen of you know, sadly, uh, George Floyd in Minnesota. Um, uh, or Rodney Levy, uh, Levy or Chantel Moore in New Brunswick, um, can this, can a law like Bill 21 make religious minorities uh, a target for violence, intolerance, and acts of hatred? Uh, what do you have to say uh, about this, uh, Samir? Uh, do you think, uh, and, and have you seen it already, or do you think these, these uh, you know, these laws can lead to and will lead to um, you know, physical violence um, and backlash targeting uh, the Muslim community in particular in, in, in the Quebec province? Uh, uh, this is a very legitimate question, by the way. And let's not forget that the, 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 the terrorist attack in Quebec City against the mosque and, and, and having the six people, the six innocent Canadians there. Yeah? And I always repeat it, uh, the first three days of this massacre, we didn't sleep down. We, you know, there were no, our eyes were not closed. I mean, and, and we, were, we were just running day and night to make sure that the other community uh, organization centers are safe. We have to call the uh, uh, police, we have to call, uh, we have to be everywhere to make sure that, believe it or not, right? in Canada, we're not in the war zone. I have parents because I'm in education at the same time. My parents calling me to tell me, can I send my kids to schools? And this is not a war zone. I'm not talking about any other country in, uh, with all respect to other countries. This is Canada. So yes, I'm not saying the law itself will lead. I'm saying the implications of legitimizing hate and discrimination against women and against other Canadians and Quebecers is what is so dangerous. Okay, when I am an average Quebecer, I'm an average person, I see my, my ideal politician uh, giving himself the okay to, to, to discriminate against others. What do you expect from an, an average person to do so? He was just imitated. I firmly believe it has to do with the populism the, the, the uh, expansion in the Western world. It's not, it doesn't have to do with religion. It doesn't have to do with against Islam. It's not a religious war. And I was very clear to say, Islamophobia is not a religious war. I mean, by all means. And, and we don't believe it is Christians against Muslims or Muslims against Christians. Uh, it is a cheap policy that can, uh, politicians feel that they can earn a very quickly voices. And I have with all respect to the polls that you have mentioned, Dr. Taha. With all respect, when I received a phone call, I'm in the regions. I'm a fresh connector in the regions. I received a phone call, and someone says to me, you know what, hijab is against your tradition. Those people are expanding against what you believe in. Are you with or against? I mean, the, the nature of the, we work on polls. The nature of the question will, will, will get the answer. But if you ask, those women are Quebecers. They are deprived from their rights. They are being targeted as women. The complete answer the complete respondent different. So how you ask is one thing and then the answer. So it's not correct that all Quebecers support them as the way it is being presented to them. And this is very extremely important. The, the fact, yes, it will lead to a hate. Yes, we have seen it in huge increase in Islamophobia, huge increase targeting. Go to social media, it's just crazy. Uh, it is easy. Go to CMF page, for example. And you will see my administ my admin is completely <laughs> changed, deleting all the notes of threats. I received threats of okay. I mean, on, at, at my footstep, I mean, at my at the front door, with stickers, people there trying to, to kill my kids, to kill us all together. So it is it is something that is very very dangerous. And I think the politicians, unfortunately, they are not taking it seriously because they I feel that they are earning particularly out of it. Hmm. And. Um... 
have you uh, i mean you i know you deal with uh with the community quite a lot uh, youth a lot or their women of course um and i'm sure both of you um in in the province of quebec and you summer specifically in montreal i'm wondering what are the sentiments uh, ever since the you know uh the introduction of bill 21 and our implementation of it uh what are the sentiments uh, out there in the muslim community in particular um is there fear is there are there concerns uh among especially women and youth i mean do you hear this often and you did allude to something earlier but i'm wondering is it a widespread issue that young women uh or youth in particular um who are you know concerned about not only about their their future and prospects of of course getting a job in uh, as a public servant out there but also and especially in a, in a space of authority in those places but also um as a receiver of services as well as potentially receiver of hate uh which we, we know has been happening there have been several cases that uh, that have been uh, reported uh, ever since uh, bill 21 actually was uh, introduced so i wanted to hear from samer as well as from farid on this all right uh, let, let, let me clarify this the community has been feeling for many years not only since the uh, law uh, that it has been under siege uh, it is under uh, it has been targeted and yes there are concerns there are uh, beyond than your imagination concerns especially from young women and the the the, 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 the answers of our the feedback of our youth It's just we leave Quebec and go to another province. And and I don't think this is the much healthier situation. Okay, quite the opposite. We would like people to stay and to stick to their rights. But they feel it. And now they feel that we rejected in certain jobs. And when we go to apply other jobs, now believe it or not, let's say, there are certain, uh, let's say, I would say daycares, for example. I'll just give an example. Where it is up to this moment, it is allowed to have a woman with hijab. Now, if a woman goes apply, Many answers came. You know what? I have only I have two women that with hijab is enough for me. I don't want I don't need more. And this is where I'm, I'm talking about the dangerous aspect of such legitimate and non legitimized and approved hate and discrimination is that it is giving the private sector now and other sectors the right to say, you know what? I have to hijab is enough to me. I don't more than to hijab because this will drive the attention of the parents, blah blah blah, all those stuff. So yes, and it is affecting our youth. Do I, especially those are in their 20s where they decide to have their hijab or not, they are rethinking. Do I have, do I take such a big decision that might apply on me uh, in the future? And and the closing note for Brother Farid to have the chance to have his own input on this is that uh, we are facing uh, even, um, I'm some of our youth are uh, shying away from activism now. Uh, wow. from our, our sisters, our young sisters. Why? Because when they go online, they go on TV, my God, I have to couple, two teachers who are, uh, they were on, uh, born in Quebec and they were studying, and they did and went to CBC and Radio Canada. They were not only bombarded, they were slaughtered and bombarded by hate at work. At, so, oh my God, no one now dares to come out to the media or to the social media to defend his life. Because, and that's why they say, where are women? Don't ask me what are women. Women are being targeted, are being, you know, are being discriminated, are being bigoted, and, and then you ask me what are women. You cannot, you're scared to come out. I have two of them. They, they had to go in hiding to their uh, friends for two or three months, change their addresses, just not to be known. Uh, they went out from Facebook completely because they dared to run and, and reply to questions to the media at that time. So this is how, how, how dangerous and, and unfortunate it is. And I will, uh, unfortunately, how some of our politics, politicians really care less about what is happening on that level, unfortunately. It's unfortunate, absolutely. Fareed, do you have anything to add to this? Well, um, my, uh, in my, uh, um, you know, time spent within the Muslim community and talking to people, yeah, there is a real fear out there. There is a very real fear, and particularly for Muslim women who wear the hijab. So, um, I mean, you've got a situation where uh, Muslims may be born in Quebec or they spent most of their lives in Quebec, and particularly if they have young children. Their young children, since uh, not just since um, Bill 21, but also since, um, since uh, before that, they're looking at trying to find, um, uh, f 
find a career outside of Quebec. So they're basically having to leave their home and leave their family in order to pursue a career. And, you know, that's that's just wrong that, you know, they'd be forced to have to look elsewhere because the government and the society within the province that they they were uh, raised in or they were born in looks at them as outsiders and uh, for some reason sees the fact that they wear their hijab as some sort of threat, which it isn't. So it's a very disturbing development. And um, I think that and I think that's the reason why we need to continue to push. And, you know, to Samir's statement that you have uh, Muslim women pulling back from activism, that's the other thing. You know, mm -hmm. the only way we can build a better society is if we all are active in different ways. And it's particularly to challenge the in injustices in society. Mm -hmm. um, and if, uh, if uh, young Muslim women uh, or Muslim women in general feel that for the sake of their safety, they can't speak publicly on important issues, I'm sorry, but that is very much the sort of thing that led to atrocities that occurred in Nazi Germany, okay? Um, Francois Legault may come off as this kindly old uncle, uh, you know, soft-spoken, but the ideology he is pushing through this Bill 21 is no different than what the Nazis pushed um, in Nazi Germany against the Jews. I know people don't want to, you know, do, do that or make that analogy, but that's the thing. If you look at history and you look at the path that these sorts of things have followed, and we're seeing it in the United States in, in many ways. We're seeing similar thing happening in the United States, and it's being ha it's happening at a similar uh, at a similar uh, in a similar way in Quebec. Maybe we don't see the sort of um, outrageous stuff uh, in Quebec that comes out of the U.S., but it is happening in Quebec. And I think it's incumbent not just on Quebec Muslims, and uh, but all Muslims and anyone who is opposed to hate, bigotry, and racism of any sort, to basically stand up and challenge it wherever it happens. Because if not, then the future um, is going to be very bleak for our country. Absolutely, you're right. Um, there, there are some um, uh, people who, who who suggest that you know by institutionalizing this this type of discrimination against you know people of faith and those who are practicing and specifically muslim community women um and of course other faith groups as well uh you are creating a you know a second class citizenship here we're talking about you know literally two types of people those who are uh, fit for you know public service uh, jobs and those who are not and those who have to choose between um, their, you know, their their faith and their uh, career potentially. So, uh, is is that how people in Quebec who are racialized minorities like Muslims is that how they're feeling? Is that how they are um, sort of seeing this uh, at this point, Samer? This idea of second second class uh, class citizen. Uh, let me confirm one thing. I have uh, many times tweeted about being uh, uh, the that we refuse to be second-class citizen. And I have mentioned this in numerous uh, uh, media interviews, that in no way we will accept, as a Muslim or as a, as a human, as a citizen, that we are second-class citizen. Uh, because why, when it comes to rights, there is differentiation. When it comes to obligations and duties, we are all together. So we all pay our taxes together, uh, the same, equal, irrespective of your background. So this is where I totally refuse to be uh, and, and to feel that you are a second class citizen or to hide my identity. Uh, one other thing that I want to really to, uh, add up, that in no way we shall accept that uh, discrimination continues against our people. Uh, when I say our people as Quebecers in general, uh, I don't, uh, personally speaking, I don't use the word minority in, uh, because minority might give the uh, impression that some people are coming from outside another planet minority is a description but when it comes to political term uh, i prefer not to use it we are all quebecers we are all canadians from different backgrounds the second thing uh, about quebec and this is, is so much hypocritical quebec uh, uh, in general uh, claims that we share the human right especially women right all that we have seen, I have been in Quebec for the last 32 years, okay? continuous. I never go back just where there was. Okay, all that you have seen is the opposite to this. So women's right with conditions. It's not women's rights for every woman. And this is very, 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 something very disturbing. And let me tell you, 
uh, this fight is not only for Muslims. And that's why one of the things that I avoid speaking about, that this is Muslims against non-Muslims or Quebec against Islam or Muslims. In no way. We are Quebecers. It is certain populism, uh, populist policies against uh, segments of Quebec and Canadian uh, and Canadian societies. And this is, the, this is the fact that we all refuse. So, yes, we feel that there is uh, targeting. Yes, as I mentioned again and again. I, I repeat myself so many times about this. My worrisome is not the limitation of this onto Quebec. And you can see that in outside Quebec, now the Conservative Party, uh, if you remember to, during the Islamophobia campaign, uh, that the, the Conservative tried to came out with a motion to counter the motion that CMF was uh, adapting at that time, and Dr. Taha was working very hard on this with us, uh, is that uh, to come with, uh, with another motion counter it to dilute the issue of, uh, and just make it wider, and the waves of Islamophobia hit all the country. So the limitation is not only Quebec, it will be always, always felt across the country. And this is the most important for us. Mm. Um, I wanted to uh, just um, uh, sort of now talk a little bit, about, uh, go back to the topic of um, federal responsibility or federal government's responsibility. Um, Farid, from your perspective, I mean, why is it important for the Canadian government, the federal government, to step in and intervene, um, you know, knowing, given the fact that Canada is known for its standing as a, you know, as a fighter for human rights, um, and uh, you know, Canadian government um, has has, of course, an obligation towards people in all provinces. So, wanted to hear for your thoughts on uh, what, what, why do you think Canadian government, and you're vocal about it, and then why is it important for the Canadian government to? Um, to actually intervene and do something about uh, what's happening in the Quebec? Well, the Canadian government is responsible for all Canadians, not just Canadians in any single part of the country. Um, when the rights of Canadians anywhere um, are being violated, then it's the responsibility of the national government to try and defend those rights. And constitutionally, um, can, the, the federal government does have a... Uh, uh, an option that it can use, but it's a nuclear option, uh, as it's sometimes referred to. It's a um, provision within the Constitution. I can't remember what section it is, uh, but it's a provision within the Constitution that allows the federal government to disallow uh, provincial legislation. Now, it's a power that hasn't been used in many decades. I think the last time it may have been used was probably um, sometime in the 1940s but it is still there in the constitution mm -hmm. and so if if the if the federal government actually wanted to live up to its rhetoric about being defenders of human rights and uh, and equality uh for canadians across the country then it has that option available to it um i'm sure it's hoping that as this case makes its way through the uh through the court process that it won't have to do that but the thing is, can, the, the federal government can very easily um, bypass all the, uh, uh, you know, all the complications by just referring the law to the federal, uh, to the Supreme Court by saying we'd like a legal ruling on this um, because we think it's in the national interest. And while this process, this long drawn out legal process is happening, people's rights are being violated. So there is an option that the can or two options right now that the Canadian government could use. But as we've already said, everybody looks at those 78 seats in Quebec and the fact that, um, you know, uh, you know, if you win, if you can win a good number of seats in Quebec, that helps you to uh, to creating a, a national government. Mm -hmm. And so, so basically what uh, politicians are saying is that they're willing to sacrifice human rights and civil liberties on the altar of political expediency. That's what that's what their inaction says. And that's what the you know, what uh, the leaders of the um, parties other than the liberals were basically saying last fall during the election when they said, no, they wouldn't challenge Quebec's rights on, on Bill 21. So um, Canadians, not just Muslims, but all Canadians have to um, ask themselves what sort of government and what sort of leaders do they want? Do they want leaders who are willing to sacrifice their rights when, you know, for the sake of political gain? Or do they want leaders that live up to, uh, um, you know, their claims that they are defenders of human rights and defenders of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms? Hmm. So, um, 
let's talk a little bit about uh, the legal case itself. And I know both of you did touch a little bit on it. Um, where does it stand now? I mean, from what I understand and what I know uh, and what we know is, you know, as soon as uh, the bill was uh, basically, you know, uh, legislated back in June 2019, um, two organization, Can uh, Canadian uh, Can Canadians Civil Liberties Association, I believe, and NCCM, National Council of uh, Canadian Muslims, they launched a uh, basically a legal action against the uh, legitimacy, of course, um, of, uh, of this case and also uh, asking for suspension until, um, it, you know, its, it's constitution is actually made valid. So um, ever since what has transpired, uh, maybe Samir, you can uh, speak to that if you have any thoughts on that and, yes. and where this may be going. Yes. Uh, first of all, uh, there are now almost four or five organizations yes. that are uh, against uh, this, including the English uh, uh, School Board. And this is very important. It has uh, brought more allies uh, on the legal aspect of this. Uh, as I mentioned, as you mentioned, there was an attempt to do some sort of injunction suspension because they all know that this legal aspect may take years and years to come out with uh, his results. And in the time being, there are hundreds of people that will be deprived from their jobs and the, and the approval of hate is still there. And, and this is where, unfortunately, when Quebec used the uh, Quebec government, the tax government, used the notwithstanding clause that gives the provinces the right to override mm -hmm. certain clauses in the laws, uh, the, the Supreme Court came saying we cannot do the injunction. Now, it is supposed uh, in October, supposed to the procedure to start. I hope COVID will not postpone it, and the COVID, I mean, the, the, the pandemic, and and uh, the, the, everyone will present their uh, case. But as I mentioned again, that this kind of case is going back two or three years or four years from now, and until uh, it comes back, uh, and and at that time we don't know exactly what will be the results. Of it because uh, there are so many challenges, and it is something very new with the existence of the notwithstanding clause. I want to uh, underline here that the notwithstanding clause when the Confederation, the Canadian Confederation came together and gave those, uh, uh, this clause to the uh, provinces, the, the, the whole idea was is to give this provinces, this provinces the right to protect itself, to, to defend itself, not to use it to deprive citizens from their rights. Yeah. Okay, so the, unfortunately, it is unprecedented that Quebec uh, government has used it in, in a way that it was not meant to be in the first place. Okay? For example, I'll just give you an example. Let's say the Confederation decides to uh, uh, cancel the French language. It's not official anymore. Here, Quebec has the right to defend itself by using the language. It's just an example. Yeah. So now Quebec used it in a way that is so weird to target women, to target certain groups. So uh, unfortunately, but it is used, uh, <laughs> it is legal uh, on, on, under these uh, circumstances. And the challenges will be by uh, one October, November, Saturday, close court cases. Hopefully, what I'm hoping that all the court cases will come together. It means a political decision from the, the uh, stakeholders. And uh, they, they unite because the more they unite together, the more the effort, the more the, the, the group of lawyers that are included will look at it uh, from different angles, it's not to overlap each other. But this is up to them, and it is remain to be seen in the coming year. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let's hope if something positive comes out of all this effort and struggle that is happening, inshallah. And we believe uh, something good will come out of it, inshallah. So I wanted to ask both of you as we conclude uh, in the next few minutes, a um, couple of questions. One was, um, in all this, you know, amidst all this negative news and all the, uh, you know, sort of um, this environment of fear and anxiety that, uh, of course, Quebec Muslims, as well as um, others who are, you know, practicing, uh, people who practice their faith visibly in public. I miss all of this. In all of this, did you see any, uh, gr you know, beautiful actions of solidarity? Have you witnessed uh, people coming together uh, to support uh, the, uh, the Quebec Muslims or uh, or you know, people who are or minorities again facing um, uh, being targeted for what they practice. Um, what kind of response from the wider Quebec community 
or faith community or the wider civic civil society uh, in the Quebec have you seen in terms of support uh, from such groups and individuals? And I'll start with Farid and then uh, then uh, Um Well, yes, over the years, I've seen different uh, <clears throat> different examples of solidarity with uh, uh, targeted communities. I know that um, in some university camp campuses, there's a wear a hijab day, right? Where uh, where non-Muslim women wear a hijab to stand in solidarity with uh, with Muslim uh, students uh, uh, on campus. Um, I think we've seen solidarity in other ways too, not necessarily just with Muslims, but with other targeted minority groups, uh, whether it's in Quebec or uh, across Canada. Certainly, this whole summer that we've seen demonstrations across the country in support of Black Lives Matter, where people of all backgrounds are standing with members of the Black community to um, call out the injustices that, that have been um, perpetrated against that community. We've seen people stand in solidarity with Indigenous people. Um, when, uh, you know, each year for the last three years for the um, anniversary of the Quebec City mosque shooting, we've seen people of all backgrounds come together to remember and stand in solidarity with Muslims, um, not just in Quebec, but across the country. So yes, there is a, there, there is a, um, a connection out there to people who are not, you know, who are white and who are not being targeted, but they see the injustices that are happening. And they believe that in order to have a better society, in order to build a better society, we have to eliminate um, these, uh, you know, uh, this ideology of racism and white supremacy and hate from our society. We have to eliminate systemic discrimination, not just in the public sector, but in the private sector. And I think that we are at a seminal moment in history because of what came out of the George Floyd killing in the United States. And, and I think that, uh, you know, all of us who are activists and advocates, we need to try and uh, grasp this, take the bull by the horns, and make sure that the politicians don't let it fade away like they have so many times in the past by, you know, standing in sympathy with us when it matters. But then when we ask them to actually do something, you know, their attention is turned elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And Samir? In 2014, uh, the, the, the support was much wider all the communities came together because the shot the valor was clearly targeting everyone okay and and uh, widely even the health service even even uh, everything everything was there now the challenge in law 21 came at the beginning uh, and Francois Lugo uh, approached it in, in, in a, he tried to approach it in such a way that is uh, giving the impression it is just you know it could be just women in the Muslim community just this community in particular. But uh, during the process, uh, at the beginning, we might have thought that we have been successful about it by just uh, giving the impression it is just a small group that has been targeted by this and not everyone. But as time uh, start to, you know, to go ahead, you know, people start feeling that this is no, this is legitimization of discrimination and this is, uh, this is just we are giving uh, to, to, to people being targeted, uh, we are giving our approval for such thing. So this is where we start seeing the other communities coming on board, the Jewish communities, Sikh communities, uh, churches, uh, uh, English community in Quebec. So everyone starts saying, no, 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 it will not be only because when you legitimize, legitimize targeting of uh, anyone, it will be uh, not limited to this person. It will be out loud. When hate is being expressed, hate speech is being expressed, it will never be limited to someone. The moment we let it out, it will go out against everyone. So yes, we have too many communities that are coming together. And, and uh, thanks God, it is working very fine so far at, at, at the ground level. And no one can say anymore uh, that it is just a Muslim issue. And I believe it is, the, and this is one of the things that I want to conclude. The way we carried Islamophobia from 2008 to 2016, 17, 18, and we worked extremely hard on this with our committees, we said, it is, and I wrote this on many articles about this. This is not a Muslim issue, it's a Canadian issue. Exactly that is not one. It's not a Muslim issue, and I refuse to be a Muslim issue. It is a Canadian issue, it is a Quebec issue. And the way, the only way Islamophobia was, we were able to have some success in Islamophobia when we turned it from a Muslim issue to a Canadian concern. And when it's a Canadian concern, everyone has to work on it. And this is how not one was supposed to be. 
hopefully the federal government and other federal parties will not be scared of the time for the Secretary to sit in Quebec and uh, to, 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 to divert this issue to be a real concern for all of us as Canadians and Canadians, and hopefully we'll come out with a very positive result. Well, hopefully, yes. Thank you. Um, thanks for that uh, ending on a positive note. So just one last question for both of you. Um, you have one minute each um, for all Canadians who are watching. Uh, we want to hear from both of you um, on what are top three things that Canadians can do to um, oppose or challenge this bigoted, this unconstitutional, harmful, dangerous bill. Um, what are top three things? We'll start with uh, Farid, and then we'll have Samir. Well, I think the first thing is that you can write the Prime Minister and uh, your MP to basically say that, uh, you know, it's been a year since Canada made its commitment that it would intervene. Um, time has running out, and it's now time for the federal government to decide to take action. Um, you can also, um, you know, write letters to the editor uh, when you see stories about uh, about this. Um, you can donate to organizations that are trying to challenge uh, this constitutionally because constitutional legal challenges take money. And you can support groups like ours, you know, Canadians United Against Hate. We are out there challenging um, hate in all its forms against any community. Um, whether it's happening, you know, nationally or locally. Um, we need to come together as Canadians. If you believe in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms and the, um, and the rights that are supposed to be inherent for all Canadians, then when those rights are uh, violated, then, uh, then uh, you need to stand together. We need to stand together and challenge uh, those who are trying to violate our rights because uh, the, only, the only path to a future that is better than the one uh, that is today is if we all work together towards that future. Awesome. Thank you. Yes, Sam. Uh, in addition to what Brother Farid has mentioned, uh, uh, my call to all Canadians that we are all Canadians. And uh, we are here. And we are not leaving. <laughs> Our kids are here, born here. Uh, look at the positive aspect of the Muslim community. In Canada, we are the second largest group in this country are contributing beyond the imagination of anyone. Unfortunately, there are no numbers on hand, but you can see us everywhere, in hospitals, in professionals, workers, accountants, government jobs. So we are contributing to this country, and we love this country, and our, our loyalty is to this country. We are not coming from another planet, but this, we are all equal. So this is my call to every and each Canadian. We are not a threat to anyone. Do not believe on it. As I mentioned, Brother Farid, but you need to express your point of view. You have to say no to hatred. And, and, and this uh, concept of it is not targeting me, it's targeting the other. It's very dangerous target, a very dangerous target, social concept. Because as we all say, okay, so you know what, as long as it is not touching my life, it's not touching my job, I'm fine with it. And this is my problem with sports. If you ask people that are not targeted, you go and ask those people that are being targeted. What do you think about their role? You can ask people that have nothing, they don't even understand what this is the law all about. So this is my call, what does it matter to be? To be active, to be, uh, we don't give up, by the way, and we're not giving up. And we will never give up, just to let everyone know we are there and continue where we are peaceful and we'll follow all the needs of peace and political and media and advocacy to make sure that rights are equal for anyone and especially for women. Great, thank you very much. We, unfortunately, we're gonna have to end here. Um, we just wanted to uh, end by, first of all, thanking our two wonderful, wonderful guests today, Farid Khan, Samir Mazoub from, you know, United Against, uh, Canadians United Against States, as well as uh, Samir from, a Canadian Muslim Forum, uh, both very active vocal advocates from Montreal, so thank you, and from Quebec, uh, Quebec the province uh, specifically. So thank you very much for both of you sharing your time and sharing your insights um, on this very critical uh, in, uh, you know, issue. And we definitely are going to be having more conversations. It's not a one-time conversation. Uh, hate is there and it's going to be there for a long time, it seems. And we are going to be there to fight uh, and, and, and uh, challenge it, inshallah, on an ongoing basis. So thank you once again, Samer. Uh, thank you again, uh, again uh, Farid, for being here with us.
Thank you so much for having the me. Opportunity. May Allah bless you. So you Thank you, both of you. Take care. So, folks, you have heard some two uh, advocates uh, and experts in the community uh, who are in uh, in the province uh, that holds the largest, uh, second largest number of Muslims in Canada and from Montreal, uh, where Samar is uh, 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 located, which has the second largest population of Muslims in Canada after Toronto. Um, and yet, unfortunately, um, uh, you know, they are, they have been for the past actually decade facing uh, campaigns of hate uh, from uh, all levels um, uh, of, uh, of society. That, that includes, of course, the legal and uh, legislative, um, uh, and, you know, uh, bills that are unfortunately, uh, like Bill 21, that uh, renders parts of our community uh, and parts of a society second class as second class second class citizens, and uh, and that is unconstitutional, and that it, uh, causes irreparable harm to the targeted uh, racial minorities like the Muslim community, as well as of course practicing Jewish communities, as well as Sikh communities, and anybody else who would like to um, you know showcase their symbols of faith. So. Um, you have, we have a lot of work to do and a lot of work ahead of us. You have heard what you can do, inshallah, to uh, promote everybody's human rights. So thank you once again for listening to Canada Today. Uh, this is Taha Ghayur, your host on Muslim Network TV. We look forward to seeing you again. Once again, thanks to Dawanet and Toronto Muslims, CanadaMuslim.com for their marketing partnership. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.